API. The book of Haggai, or Haggai, or Haggai, right? Um, I thought about doing the, the three H books, Haggai, Hosea, and uh, Habakkuk, but uh, we'll see. All right, uh, Haggai, last week, if you remember, we got into this, and uh, it was the, uh, some of the Jews were returning back uh, from exile, and they had been in exile in Babylon, and uh, they had been sent back. Some of these Jews had actually been sent back after, after about 50 years. They just started releasing some of them and sending them back. And so we're dealing with some of them here that have come back, and they've kind of just made this journey uh, back to, to Jerusalem. And uh, what did they do? Well, they were spending all of their time when they came back in uh, making up for lost time for themselves. Okay, now, now they had started building the temple, but they kind of stopped it after a couple of years and they kind of let it go and they started building their own houses and they got wrapped up in their own lives. Okay, uh, the problem though with the people like them, the Jews getting wrapped up in their own lives, is that what? They are the people of God. So their life is not about building houses and building business. It's about, it's, it's about doing the will of God. That's really what our responsibility is as well. We're the people of God as well. And so even though we live in this world and even though we, we, we can have jobs and raise families and do all the things that people do, we can't ever forget that our first and foremost responsibility and privilege is to serve the Lord God. And so they had not done what they should have done. They had built their own houses, and God, through the prophet Haggai, uh, kind of speaks to them and says, Hey, listen, you're doing all this stuff. But what about my house? What happened to my house? And so um, they, uh, they, they, they needed to get started building it. So I want us to look in chapter 2 and verses 1 through 9. And. Uh, Notice what the Lord says to them. He's dealing with them, but also with a lot of disappointment and discouragement that they had. It says, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, we all know that one of Satan's great uh, desires is to bring discouragement to the people of God, to bring doubt concerning what God has promised. We saw that beginning in the Garden of Eden and all the way through is that God, uh, God will give us His Word. We have it. We have the wonderful promises of God uh, all in Christ Jesus, yea and amen. And we, and we know that, at least kind of, intellectually we know that, but it's easy for us to become discouraged. Uh, something doesn't work out the way we thought it should. Uh, we don't uh, live up to our own standard of how we think we should be serving God, and we become discouraged. Or the work is too hard. And it seems like whatever we're doing doesn't work. And so 
it's easy to become discouraged. And these people were discouraged, and the reason why is because uh, they wanted they were going to build this temple, but you know they could they they couldn't get past what the fact that many of them had been around when the former temple had been there. And that was Solomon's temple. That was the temple that he had built that David had saved and saved for years, and laid aside gold and silver and all the things to make all the vessels, and, and then it was destroyed. And so they're remembering what it used to be. Well, so Haggai asked the question, who's left among you that saw this house in her glory? Who remembers that? And I think it's important for them to deal with this, is to say, hey, it was, it was really good, but here was the problem, that even though they could remember this glorious temple, they also had to be reminded of what? Why they were sent into captivity. They didn't really appreciate the temple that they had. They had worshipped idols. They had gone with the pagans of the land. They had gone into all kinds of stuff. And so, so what? They had a glorious temple. They were, they were uh, dishonoring it, okay? And it was a beautiful temple uh, somewhere you can read about all the gold and all the splendor that it had, uh, over some $25 million worth of gold lined that temple, okay? Uh, you know, huge uh, thing. And um, people would come just to see it. The Shekinah glory filled the temple and the praises of God were there. And now they're looking at the temple that they're building now. And it's an embarrassment. It seems like, gosh, you know, what have we done? This is bad. It's small. It's shabby compared to the temple that had been destroyed. Now, if you look back to the book of Ezra, which is contemporary with what Haggai uh, has, Ezra, if you find Nehemiah, just keep turning left. Ezra chapter 3 and verse 9 through 13, Ezra 3, verses 9 through 13. Ezra, 9. Ezra 3, verse 9. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priest in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. So how confusing was this, okay? You got some of them that are shouting for joy, and other ones are weeping for sadness over the same work that they're doing, because all that some can remember is how it used to be. And all the ones shouting for joy can think about is how wonderful it's going to be to have a temple. So here they are, and they're working on this, and they're working together, and um, it, is, it, it, is an, it is a strange kind of thing. You know, we can look back, you know, as a boy, I was raised in church all my life, and wonderful times of seeing God work and, and seeing uh, great revivals and great amounts of people that would, that would be saved. And then throughout the years, you go, and now we're living in a time where people really... They don't want anything to do with God. And, and, and they really don't care. And the people of God even don't seem to want much to do with God. And you find many so-called Christians that are, you know, they're downright pagans in their worship much of the time. You know, um, 
it, it's amazing uh, that, you know, today is, uh, what is it, Ash Wednesday, okay? So you have all these people walking around with ashes on their heads and, and uh, newscasters having ashes on their heads and all these things. But there are many non-Catholic churches that are practicing this thing as well as observing Lent. And they're going through this thing, and I wrote an article about that, that basically, you know, Lent, first of all, if you're going to fast and you're going to pray and you're going to do all this stuff, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, you're not to disfigure your face. You're not to put on a big show about it. You're not to let anybody know what you're doing. And also I mentioned, I said, and what does Tammuz have to do with Christ? Absolutely nothing. Tammuz was the uh, so-called son of Semiramis, a goddess, and um, you know the women of Israel would go in the mountains every year and mourn his death for 40 days. That's what Lent does. It's the same thing. And so my question was, how can you, who say you're a follower of Christ, take your cues from paganism rather than from the Bible? You see, we're living in that time where nobody has any distinctions about anything. Yesterday I read the, um, a biography of the, of the man, of the pastor and speaker and writer uh, in the first half of the 20th century, A.W. Pink. And um, as I was reading about this man, you feel sorry for him after a while because he had such a sensitive nature about him that he would go to speak to places and they would throw him out. Uh, he went to Australia and he spoke to crowds and great crowds were coming and, and people were being saved, but then he got invited to start speaking at churches and then they asked him to come and speak to a group of Baptists and he went and spoke on the sovereignty of God. And he spoke on this message of sovereignty of God, and they threw him out. They said, you're not going to be allowed to preach in any of our churches in Australia. So he went and found a little reformed church, and he began to preach on the sovereignty of God. And they loved that, except that they thought that he gave too much responsibility to man. And so they threw him out. And so nowhere he could go was he accepted? So he just kept moving around and he wrote things and he was the first guy to ever have a mailing list. Okay, he had a mailing list and he would send out these little Bible studies. He had a thousand people on his list and uh, he would send these things out. Ended up his life in Scotland or in the Isle of Hebrides and um, got to where he didn't want to go to church at all. He just said, hey, you know what? It's better with the condition of churches in his day, with the condition of the churches, it is better to stay home and read your Bible than to go listen to that. Well, you know, I would disagree with that, but I'd, sometimes I can agree with some of what his, 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 his attitude was. But he was a kind of a moody kind of guy, and yet he could make statements like, the best of men are but men at best. Meaning, you don't, you don't expect much of people because they're doing the best they can because that's all they are as men. Well, he understood that, but still he felt bad. You see, we can get discouraged by even what should be good because all we can see is how bad everything is. When we should not look at all the bad all the time, we should recognize it, but we have to look to God. Because God is going to finish what He started, and God is always going to be glorified no matter what. And we ought to rejoice in that. And join in that glory, okay? Um, you're not going to straighten everybody out. I learned that a long time ago, and so I've kind of just lived my life, just, just give the truth, and whoever wants it, wants it, and who doesn't, doesn't, and, and you know, I can go along with that. Um, but this is what these people had to deal with, is that, they couldn't get over how the temple used to be, and they weren't sure they wanted the new one. Well, God tells them, you know, uh, remember that, 
But also, he wanted to mention some things that they had forgotten. If you look in verse 4 and 5, it says, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenant with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. So the Lord says, okay, here's some things you may have forgotten. First of all, you know what? You came out of Egypt and I brought you out. And we should never forget what the Lord has done. Okay, Never forget what God has done in your life. Because that was... That was mercy, wasn't it? That was mercy and grace that he would do anything in your life. Okay? Um, I was reading just not long ago where uh, it says that the older you get in the Lord, it oftentimes comes the fact that you, the, uh, the, 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 the older you are, the more aware you are that you shouldn't be in the family of God at all. Isn't that amazing? Because the older you are and the more you walk in the Lord, the more you realize this is all mercy. There's nothing about me that should have appealed to God whatsoever. And what a wonderful thing that was, you see. And so he's reminding them and he tells them in verse 6, he says, listen, uh, or verse uh, 4, he says, be strong, be strong. And uh, why? Why be strong? Because I'm with you. I'm with you. Never forget the Lord is with us. Never forget that He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What does never mean? Never. Okay. What does never mean in the Greek? Never. It's not going to happen. And I like some place where it says, no, not never. I like those double negative, no, not never. Okay. Uh, you don't get good grades in English with that, but it's a great statement that God makes. No, not never. Why? Because He wants to make sure to our simple sheep minds that they can trust the shepherd. They can trust Him and know that no matter how bad it may be, He's with us. Now, you think about um, Paul. Remember Paul who... When he is coming to the Isle of Malta, he's on his way to Rome. We haven't got there yet in, in Acts, so I'm just give you a little heads up, okay? So he came, he's, he's on this ship, and he had a shipwreck, and it's all broken up, and so they kind of all, all get to the um, Isle of Malta there, and Paul, and building the fire and stuff, whatever, a viper jumps out of the fire and grabs his hand. Now we know he shakes it off right? Um, he doesn't die. The poison doesn't hurt him. But you know what I think did hurt him? I think the bite hurt him. See, God will protect us, but not always from pain. And so, you know, I don't think he shook it off because he said, oh, that shouldn't be here. I think it bit him and he shook it off, okay, like we would do. Well, we're not protected always from the painful things of life. But what should that cause us to do? Well, what does it cause a small child to do when they have pain? They go to mom, they go to dad, whoever is close to them. They go running there. Why? Because that's where their, their, their help is going to come from. Where do we go when we're in pain? We should go to the Lord. Now, many times we'll go to our best friend who doesn't know any more than we do about what's happening. You know, and, and make sure that if you have best friends, whatever they mean, I don't know what that means, but what, if you have a best friend, make sure that it's a godly person who's not going to spend their time, wasting your time giving you their advice or their take on something. That's not what you need. You need somebody else who stands for what you say you believe. And so here we, we have the Lord reminding them of the things that we oftentimes forget and uh, he is telling them, listen, my spirit's going to remain with you. I'm going to be right where I've always been. I mean, Abraham might be gone and Moses might be gone and David might be gone and Solomon is gone and the temple is gone, but I'm here. So we don't need 
all of that stuff to make sure that we're okay. We need God. Now, I remember learning this many, many years ago, and I've had to learn it over and over again because I'm, I have a sheep mind. And so, but I remember in this uh, first church that I ever pastored, and right in downtown Long Beach, and uh, it, was, it was in, the, it was in the, the real ghetto area of Long Beach, and it was, it was bad. And, um, and the church was like, it was just like right on the, right on the sidewalk. Okay. The bus was stopped in front of the church. That was like the only good thing. We could just have them get off the bus and stagger in. But it, it, would, it, was, it was busy out there on the street. Cars always going by. People yelling and screaming. People shooting. All kinds of stuff. And here we are in this, in this little church, Central Baptist Church that's no longer there. And so I, I, I'm there and, and, I, and I was just like always wanting people to work. Wanting people to do something. Because I had... It was me, and I think I was the age of 19 years old, and here I had a church, about 100 people, and most of them were like 70 years old and older. And, I, and the woman that played the piano, her and her husband, he led the music, and, and she played the piano, and it was always like, dun, dun. it was very slow. And her husband, Glenn Sutter, would look at her, and his name was Gladys, and he'd say, We'll wait, Gladys. And I remember that all the time, how he just smiled. And, and, but I, I thought, Lord, we need people. Well, some cousins of mine began to come. And here they are coming, and they're helping, and they're young, and they're excited. And so they're helping to get some things done that need to get done. They're going out on outreach. They're doing this. And so they, they were there about three or four months. And then uh, my cousin, she said to me, uh, my husband has a job, and we're going up to Northern California. And I, but you can't. <laughs> I, I need life. But they left, and the church went on, and it grew, and people were coming, and people were being saved. You see, I had to learn, I don't need to rely on any person. I need to trust God. And many times, God will put us in situations where all we have is Him. And He kind of, you can imagine, He might say, well, now, what are you going to do? You're going to trust me, or are you going to keep floundering around? Well, you have to trust him. And you grow that way, don't you? So he is here and with them, and they don't need to be afraid of anything else. Now, here's the problem, though. In verse 3, remember, he asked them, Who among you saw this house in her first glory? Well, we've talked about how, how glorious the temple was and how it was built, but did you know what was in that temple that's not going to be in their temple? The altar is gone. The, the Ark of the Covenant is gone. There's no glory in the temple. Where did God, where did the Shekinah glory of God come down upon? Remember when they talked about the tabernacle, that it would come down where? In the Holy of Holies. It would come down there. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant was there. It contained the Ten Commandments and the uh, rod that, that, uh, of Aaron that had budded, and it had uh, these things in there, and people were to remember that. And it's gone. Where had it gone? Well, it was taken when they went into exile. And it was never returned. And yet God is saying here that the glory of this temple is greater than the glory of Solomon's temple. Now, you might say, well, how did that happen? Well, we could say, well, later on, they refurbished it. They added some room, because it was a small temple, and they added some more things in there, and that made it look a little fancier. And then this Idumean guy by the name of Herod the Great, he added more into this temple, and he really dressed it up. And, and it, was called, it wasn't called the temple of God at that point. It was called Herod's temple. But it was the same thing. And so people might say, well, that's where the glory came from. But still there could be no glory without the ark. Did you know that all the time that Jesus went to the temple, there was no ark of the covenant there? When the Holy of Holies, when the curtain was torn from, from, from top to bottom, 
There was no, there was no ark there. There was nothing to see. What did it reveal? The emptiness of their own worship. Why? Because Jesus came as the sacrifice, did he not? He came as the one who laid his life on the altar. The glory of the temple was going to be who? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we're looking at, that he would come. Now, many times we can be discouraged because we don't, we don't think about those things. We don't think about what God has already promised to us. And we start making comparisons, don't we? You see, we start, like these people, they just saw shabbiness. That's all they saw. Okay? Um, you know, we look at our own church buildings, and, you know, I, they're okay. They're not fancy. And many times we just see things that are broken or something like that, and we say, oh, my, what's going to happen? But I just see a place where, where God is worshipped. And sometimes I want things like, you know, we are fixing that kitchen door before Saturday, and so it's being done tomorrow. And uh, we're getting that done. But, um, you know, sometimes things don't look as good as they should. But we still have a wonderful Lord, don't we? You know, uh, I love to look at the stories and the things about what missionaries are doing today. And, and um, when my sister was a missionary in Africa, her husband and I, they would send back pictures many times. And I remember this little church in Kenya that, um, you know, they were just like little benches there, and it was like a ramshackle kind of shack thing, you know, and it had a little crooked sign out in front and said some kind of church in whatever language they had, uh, Swahili. And so, uh, but you see people in there, and they're all smiling, and they're all happy, and they're hearing the Word of God preached because that's all that mattered. Do you realize that that's all that matters about our church or any other church? Is the word of God going forth? That's all that matters. Is God being worshipped through his word? That's all that matters. One of the things that we probably should study more, but we just kind of do it anyway, and we're not perfect at it. But I really believe that it is very important that we not try to add stuff to our worship to make it attractive to lost people. Lost people don't worship God anyway. So we don't need lights, we don't need fog, we don't need anything else. You know, I, I always think, you know, I've, I've been to some of those churches, and I'm not running them down, I just want you to understand something, that when we read in the scripture that men love darkness rather than light, what do you notice about all those churches? They're dark inside. Why? Because men love what's going on on the stage. Rather than just opening up the book and preaching it. You say, well, it attracts lost people. Here's what I've learned. If you have to attract lost people by doing that, you have to keep doing it. The minute you stop entertaining, that's when they leave to go to a bigger show. So what do you want to do? Just preach the Word of God. Make it simple. Make it plain. Make it hard-hitting. People need to know that they're sinners. They do not need to be patted on the back in their sin and say, you know, it's okay, we all make mistakes. No, what we need to say is we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we all deserve hell. We do not deserve a free pass anywhere. It took the death of our Savior to get us saved. That's what it did. We have to say that to people. Because if we don't, we're, we're offering something that's not true. We're just simply saying God wants to you know, come to our church and we're going to teach you how to have a wonderful marriage. Well, that's nice. But here's the thing. You get a husband and wife reading the Word of God together, their marriage may not be perfect, but it's going to be more wonderful than it was. Why? Because they're putting God first. Okay? Please don't think that Christians, when they do that, that everything is perfect. It's not. Okay? Because we're not perfect but we keep saying faithful on God's word. This is, this is what we need to understand, is that God is reminding them that he is with them and stop making comparisons of all the stuff that you used to have or you used to, 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 to do. Don't let the enemy discourage you, okay? Um, remember, if you look in John 21, um, 
John chapter 21. Familiar thing where Jesus has come along the shore and he is talking to Peter, revealing himself to his disciples. And in um, verse 15, Notice what it says. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, Feed my lambs. And he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, carry thee whither thou wouldst not. And this spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Now here's an interesting thing. And, and we're not going to get into all, all the different ways Jesus asked him to love him and how Peter responded. The fact is that Jesus asked him three times why. Let's, let's look at the obvious reason, because Peter denied him three times, okay? So Jesus is saying, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter has to say, yes, I love thee. Yes, I love thee. Yes, I love thee. Um, even to the point of being almost exasperated with Jesus, because you keep asking me the same question. Well, then Jesus begins to tell him what's going to happen to him. When you're older, you're going to be led where you don't want to go. He's talking about what kind of death that he's going to die. And he's telling him, and so Peter is like hearing this, and, and, and so what does he do? He does what many of us might do. Peter, in verse 20, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast, breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Okay, Lord, you've told me, you've asked me if I love you, I love you. You told me how I'm going to die, but what about this guy? What about John? What's going to happen with him? Now, I love how Jesus responds to people. Because he's not like us many times that we feel obligated to answer foolish questions in a lengthy discourse. What does Jesus say? Verse 22, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. What is Jesus really saying? What's it to you? What does his life have to do with you? What do you have to do with him? Jesus can do whatever he wants with each of us, and none of us are going to end up the same way. But by God's grace, we'll all end up in the same place. Isn't that going to be great? Now, people always have, they want to ask questions, and we'll, we'll get back to Haggai, but they always want to ask questions. Well, will you get to see this person when you go to heaven? And they ask me those questions. I don't know. I have never been there. But I want to tell you something. We will know, the Bible says, even as we are known. We're all, the things will be open to us. I'm sure we're going to run into everybody. Well, how long is it going to take before I can meet my loved one who's gone. How long am I going to be able to meet them? Well, like five minutes after you get, no. You don't know. But let's say that it takes, it takes a million years before you get to see your loved one because you're spending the first million years just staring at Jesus. It's still okay because we're going to be there for all of eternity. No, no one is going to be looking at their watch or their calendar or their cell phone saying, come on, man. I've been here all this time. When am I going to get to see my dad, my mom, my brother? When am I going to see them? No, we're going to see him. And this is the wonderful thing. We don't go to heaven to see the others. We go to heaven to see the Lord. And he'll take care of all the rest of the stuff. Okay? 
learn down here to just trust God with everything. And when you get to heaven, you don't have to worry so much. Okay? He's got it under control. If he could handle this mess, he certainly can handle heaven. And so this is what we need to see is that God is telling these people, don't be discouraged, don't give up. You need to just let go of all of that stuff you're holding on to, all the memories, all the way it used to be. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that you're faithful now. You're faithful now. Sometimes, you see, this is how you know you get old, okay? Is that you start remembering stuff that used to happen and you look back at it and you say, oh, wow, how come that doesn't happen now? Well, first of all, because you don't have the energy to do that. Okay? And, um, uh, you know, Miley goes to this, uh, all these play rehearsal stuff. And so I went to pick her up and last week. And you could see uh, the director is telling these girls to leap. And uh, they're leaping across. I can't do that. And, and so they're, they're leaping. And I, I say to Miley when we're going to the car, I said, how come you didn't ask you? And she just looked at me. I can't do that. I said, well, you can do a cartwheel. But he didn't ask for a cartwheel. He asked for leaping. So I was trying. I said, listen, you need to work on this. I said, I'll help you. And so here I am, and I'm, and I'm trying to do the leap. And, but, you know, you can't even pick your legs up. Have you noticed that? Is that, you know, you, I mean, to jump like, and I just said, forget it. Not everybody can leap. You don't need to do it. Don't think back about what you could do back in the past and how you, you served God and how you did this. I remember one time driving, going with a group of young people, and we're stopping at different places along the way, all the way up to Northern California, and we'd stop at gas stations and those places that serve food that call them gas stations. And so here you are, you're standing outside, and we're all in this big van, and we get out and we start singing and we pr start preaching. And, and I thought, how come people don't do that today? because that was then and this is now. But here's what I keep remembering. God has placed each of us here now in the deadest time of history, I think, for a purpose. And that purpose is that His life might shine through us in whatever it is. Don't just think that, you know, the way that we got to reach people is always going to the park. Sometimes this is just doing your job really well and talking to people at your work when you get a chance and sharing the gospel. Sometimes it's out mowing your grass and you see your neighbors mowing their grass and they have a newer lawnmower. And so you want to go over and take a look at it. And so you start talking about the Lord. Just be available to people. And God will use you because I think what people need to see now is not what kind of church services we have. They need to see what kind of people we are that follow God. Don't be like they are. Be different. And so God is saying you need to not walk around like you're half dead all the time. You've got to look up to the Lord and you can trust him. And God says to them in verse 6 and 7, he says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet uh, once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Maybe they're thinking, we don't have the money to build this temple. You know, we don't have the money that Solomon had. We don't have any of that. And what does the Lord remind them of? It wasn't Solomon's money. All the silver is mine. All the gold is mine. In one place, he says, the cattle on the thousand hills is mine. It does not mean that he's counting literally a thousand hills and he's saying, I put my cattle some on each hill. No, it, it, it's a figure that means what? All of it is mine. Thousand oftentimes is just simply used to, to, to describe a completeness of what God has. Okay? That it is the full time. Many people, they get wrapped up in the thousand years, rain and this and that. It's just God's reign is eternal. And God's ownership of everything, He owns it all. 
You see? And he can take care of us. You see? Um, and this is what he's telling these people. You don't have to worry about what you don't have. In Isaiah 45, several times the Lord says to the people, I am the Lord and there is none else. Do you believe that? I am the Lord and there is none else. That's a tremendous thing. I know somebody right now that, that you know, they're always complaining about, you know, I'm 36 years old and, you know, and I don't even have a career yet. I don't even know what I'm going to do. I don't know this. So what, man? Who cares? Live for the Lord. Okay? I mean, well, i got to go to school so I can learn something. You're 36. If you haven't learned by now, what will you learn? And what are you looking to know? You know, it's, it's important that we just settle down and realize that God is going to use us in the way that he wants. I mean, who, who taught David how to kill a giant? Nobody did. How did he do it? He never did it before. How did he do it? Because he went in the name of the Lord. He went in the name of the Lord and God did the fighting for him. You know, I, I, that's one person. After, I don't know how long it's going to take to find David, but I am going to find him and say, hey, you know, were you really that good with a slingshot? Or were you as surprised as a giant was when that rock hit him? Because Goliath is wearing a helmet, and there's only a small space here to hit. And David, boom, right there. How did that happen? Well, maybe he was good. Or I prefer to think that God is good. God glorified himself. Listen, we've got to keep looking ahead. You know, God never tells us to look back. He tells us to keep looking forward and keep moving forward, to keep going. You know, um, you know, my father used to say when people would talk about the good old days, and he would oftentimes say, um, I don't know what good old days you're talking about, but they weren't all that good. <laughs> lived through the Depression. Lived through, he's, it wasn't great times. You know, people talk about, well, what a wonderful time to have lived in the days when, like, that was that TV family, the Waltons. What a wonderful time to have lived during that time. I don't know anybody who lived like that, really. And, uh, you know, if they did, wonderful. But uh, uh, you know how people survived? They just trusted God. Trusted God. Looked ahead at God. God is going to shake all the nations. It's, quote, this is the same thing as quoted over in Hebrews chapter 12. And it's linked to the coming of the Messiah. That he is coming. God shook the earth when he gave his law. He'll shake it again when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And one day this world with all the false religions, the dead works, it's going to be shaken to pieces. There'll be nothing left. You know, how do we get these people that are running for office to believe in God? Probably you can't. But one day they will, but it'll be too late. I know people that are trying to make, let everybody know that Donald Trump is a Christian. I don't know if he is or not because I don't see his heart. But I will say this, that it doesn't really matter to me whether he is or not. I pray for him because he's in the position he's in. But I certainly don't hold any illusions that he's going to save the world. You know, and um, I do know that Whatever happens in our nation happens because God will allow it to happen. But what does he require of us? To be faithful. To not give up. To not lose hope. To not think that the end is here and there's nothing else that we can do. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day, listen, when the Lord comes, do you think that the first temple of Solomon was glorious and that the fact that the second temple was glorious because Jesus was there. Wait till you see the glory of the third temple. And I'm not talking about some building in Jerusalem. I'm talking about the glory of God's people around the throne. That's the temple of God. What a tremendous thing that is. And it's going to be great. It's going to be a wonderful experience. Why? Because God is bringing all things to 
pass. And we can get discouragement. You know, I remember David Brainerd writing in his journal because he went to the Indians, American Indians, and they didn't want to hear the gospel. They, they had watched. And one of their problems was because they'd seen how, how, uh, how the white men had treated them. And they didn't want anything to do with that. They felt it was a white man's religion. They wanted nothing to do with it. And yet David Brainerd would go out there and spend all night praying by, by trees in the snow. And it would melt around him. And he was a young man, died of, what, I think, the age of, of 29 of tuberculosis. But here this guy is praying and praying. But he writes in his journal concerning this. My heart sunk. It seemed to me that I'd never have any success among the Indians. My soul was weary of my life and I longed for death. Wow. What kind of missionary was that? But then... For two years, nothing happened. Discouragement after discouragement. But then after three and a half years, you know what happened? He saw 150 Indians come to Christ. And then it went on and it began to grow and begin, and they began to preach to other Indians. The Indians did. They began to reach others. And his work progressed. And at age 29, he died. Having won who knows how many to Christ. Tremendous. But that wasn't all of it because there was another missionary by the name of William Carey who went to, um, to uh, India and here, and, and here he is there. And why did he, is, why did he become a missionary? He's, uh, William Carey is known as the father of modern missions. He went in, what, 1720, okay, modern missions. And so why did Carey go? Because of the diary of David Brainerd. Who knows what God can do with your life long after you're gone? I mentioned that guy, A.W. Pink. You know what? He died thinking that nobody really cared about the work that he was called to do. Nobody cared about his writings. But now, you know what? You can't go anywhere where there are reliable books sold that his books are not there. He has, he has ministered, I would say, to millions of people over the years. Why? Because it wasn't God's time then in his life. It's God's time now. What kind of God do we serve? The only God there is. And who always does all things well. Listen, they built this church, I mean, the, the, the temple, and God said, just do it. Do it and be strong. Do it. Don't give up. Keep at it. Don't get involved with other kinds of works all the time. Do the work of the ministry. Do it all. You know, uh, we are called to go. Look, if you would, very quickly to Romans chapter 13. Romans, the 13th chapter. And look in verses 11 through 14. Something that the Jews needed to hear and something we certainly need to hear in Romans 13, beginning in verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What is Paul saying here? He's saying everything you do is done for the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't spend your life trying to build a fleshly life. Spend your life trusting God to meet your needs and live for Him. That's what glorifies God. Americans have a hard time with that. So I think one day God is going to do something in this nation that's going to bring us to our knees. That would be His mercy, wouldn't it? To say, hey, I have the wrong priorities. I'm living for myself. He says, go and do it. Work, work, work. Serve God. And you get tired, you get worn out, so you take a nap and get up again. 
you know, and uh, sometimes I can't sleep, and so, um, so when I can't sleep, I get up, you know, because I, I, I think it's foolish to lay there, and you know, you can't sleep, and so I get up. Yesterday morning, I remember getting up at at, at two thirty in the morning, and and spending some time in the Word of God and praying and taking care of some uh, texts and some emails I had to take care of, and. Um, and I made a visit in Long Beach and later in the evening, and I got back about 9 o'clock, and uh, I finally fell asleep about 10.30. But that was a long day. But it was a good day. You get up the next day, you're ready to go again. Why? Because doing things for the Lord makes an impact on your life as well as the lives of others. These people, they're, what a privilege they had to have Haggai there with them. All right, well, let's stop there. Um, do we have any prayer requests or anything?